So welcome back to our uh, first section of forensic pathology, where we finished off talking about some of the history involved in um, forensic pathology, and we ended up talking about the difference between coroners and medical examiners. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at autopsies themselves. When do you perform an autopsy? You perform an autopsy when there's a violent death. When we don't know what caused the death. When there is an unwitnessed death, so in other words, even if there's uh, someone in poor health uh, and they find this, this person in their apartment and they're dead, um, we don't just assume, oh, well, they died of whatever illness they had. Unless the death has been witnessed, unless um, the, the cause of death is, is, again, been witnessed by someone else, there can be an autopsy involved. Also, if it's death related to employment, uh, for example, at the school, if someone died while working at the school, they would perform an autopsy to see was it the fault of the school, was it the fault of the person themselves, was it someone else's fault who caused this person's death. If there is deaths which might be related to, I don't know, say a pandemic, you guys might want to might wanna Google search the word pandemic in case you're not sure what that means. If there's some sort of public health issue, public health scare, and this person um, shows any type of symptoms or signs related to that public health scare, they can order an autopsy. And by they, I mean um, the, the law enforcement can order autopsies usually over the objections of the, uh, the next of kin. Now, there's also medical autopsies. In other words, someone dies on the operating table. Um, we knew they were in poor health. Why would you perform an autopsy? If they died of a particular disease, they can perform an autopsy and take a look at what did this disease do to the internal organs. They can learn more about the disease by studying someone who has died from a particular disease or problem. If this person had been treated, say it's cancer, and this person had been treated for a long period of time with particular chemicals, they can do an autopsy to determine was the treatment effective? Did it do anything? Did it slow the progression? Did it damage other parts of the body? So while most of these situations, this is pretty much the, um, the purview of the law enforcement. Medical autopsies a lot of times are um, sort of voluntary. Uh, they go to the next of kin and they say, we'd like to do an autopsy to find out what happened with this disease and how the treatment worked. So there's more than just criminal investigations involved in the actual autopsies. Now we mentioned in part one, how there's certain parts of the death investigation. There's three major things that we're going to focus on when we're investigating a death. Number one is the cause of death. Number two is the manner of death. And number three is the time of death. And the cause of death and the manner of death, uh, that's, that's something we really need to take a close look at. Because there's some very specific legal terms that, that apply in these cases. So, let's start with the manner of death. The manner of death is a legal description. This is something that we use in court. And it's going to actually refer to what happened or what was the point of the situation which caused this person's death. And what we mean by that is we can label a death a homicide. It's a death caused by another person. And now when you hear manslaughter or, or uh, negligent homicide, all these things can have one thing in common, and that is the death was caused by another person. Compare that to suicide, the death is caused by the person intentionally trying to kill themselves. So there's your intent right there. The, another category, another legal category is accidental. Um, there is no intent, but they were caught in a natural disaster, a uh, car crash, uh, falls, any type of thing that um, was not specifically designed to cause a death, but caused it anyway. 
Diseases in old age lead to natural death. Although some states do include deaths from risky procedures as being natural. In other words, you go into, um, you're going to have surgery for to fix some sort of problem, but uh, the person is rather old or the person has uh, uh, serious medical issues, and it's a very risky procedure with a high chance of death. Uh, they perform it, the person dies on the, on the table. It can be ruled as a natural death because that person was, that person's physical condition uh, was a major contributing factor to their actual death. And then finally, there's undetermined. There's no obvious cause. And what happens in a lot of cases is in the beginning, after the, the first autopsy, after the, the initial uh, findings, they can leave the cause of death as undetermined, or the manner of death as undetermined, and then with more information and more autopsy work, they can um, uh, change it to one of the other categories. So the manner of death is a legal description, and it involves one of these categories, although some states may have other categories as well on top of this. But when we start talking about the cause of death, this is a medical determination. Now, it's another term that's often used when we're talking about the cause of death, and that's the mechanism of death. That's what caused the person to actually expire. So, if, for example, blunt force trauma. If someone is beaten severely and that causes them to lose blood and die, the cause is the blunt force trauma. That's what caused this mechanism to occur. Now, they can list the cause of death as blunt force trauma or some other um, reasoning why, but then they can also list contributing causes. What, uh, what conditions did that person have which made it more likely for them to die, or what conditions did, did that person have that made them more susceptible to this type of death? Uh, things such as smoking or drug use, heart disease, um, not so much with blunt, it could be actually with blunt force trauma. If you have heart disease and um, you're, you're beaten up, uh, you could become so agitated and upset that it actually causes heart failure. However, in a situation like that, the injuries are considered the cause of death, and that's the most important part. So, again, if you insult, assault a person with a bad heart, you can't say, well, the only reason he died was because he had a bad heart. No, the reason why he died is because he was assaulted. The assault caused the death. The heart condition was just a contributing factor to it. So, manner of death, legal term, cause of death, medical term, uh, the mechanism is actually what physically happened to the person which caused them to expire. That brings up the third category we're going to talk about, and that is time of death, otherwise known as PMI, post-mortem inter interval, after death time. And that's the time between the death and the discovery of the body. So what's the post-mortem interview? How long after they expired did you find them? And we're going to be talking about all sorts of ways in which you can estimate the time of death, but one of the ways is through biochemical markers. Remember how we talked about, um, we talked about markers in the blood? There could be markers in the blood that indicated when a person died, when certain processes start happening. We also talked about vitreous humor. That's the fluid in the eye. That could also give us information as to how long since the person expired. Once you die, certain chemical processes in your body stop and other chemical processes start. And if you know about these processes and how long they take, you can track back and figure out how long has that person actually been dead. Time of death is a little bit tricky. In the first 72 hours, the time of death is more accurate. So when you find the body quickly, there's a lot of information you can use to be much more accurate as to when that person died. The longer the time interval, the less accurate it's going to be. So we can't say, oh, this person died three weeks, two days, 14 hours, and 17 seconds ago. It's a longer time. It's going to be less accurate. But to help us out in determining the time of death, we can use three types of things known as rigor mortis, liver mortis, or algor mortis. 
Now, if you ask anybody what rigor mortis is, they'll probably come up with a, a pretty good description of it. This is the stiff muscles. Your body becomes really stiff. What happens is after death, your body loses the ability to relax its muscles, so they stay contracted. Rigor mortis generally begins between four and six hours after death. So if rigor mortis is just starting to set in, we know that this person expired uh, somewhere between four and six hours ago. Rigor mortis is at its maximum between 12 to 24 hours after death. And after that, it starts relaxing a little bit. But it can last, signs of rigor mortis can last for up to 72 hours. So you can see, here is that early interval after death. We find the body fairly soon after death, and we can use something such as rigor mortis to get us an idea as to how long since the Now, rigor mortis generally begins in the smaller muscles, the hands, the arms, and then it moves to the larger muscles. So the feet, hands, and arms, and legs will show signs of stiffening first, and then the, uh, the larger muscles in the, the main trunk of the body will start to show stiffness. And that's another way we could do it. If we said that uh, rigor mortis is just beginning because their hands and feet seem to be stiffening up a little bit, that tells you we have an earlier time where the entire body appears to be stiff, then we know that we're into a much longer period of time. Compare that to liver mortis. And what liver mortis has to do is with lividity. And lividity has to do with what happens to the blood. How does the blood settle? While you're alive, your blood is running through your veins and arteries pumped by your heart. When you die and your heart stops, your blood begins to settle. Not only that, but your blood vessels open up a little bit. Your skin dilates. That means opens up. That means blood can flow more easily through your body. And it ends up flowing based on gravity. So for the first 8 to 12 hours, the blood can still move through your body. It flows freely. You roll the body over, the blood will move. After this time, it becomes what's called fixed. The reason why this happens is the blood is now starting to congeal. The blood is starting to, to harden up, to dry up, and then it's going to stay put. So for the first 8 to 12 hours, if you move the body, the blood moves with it. But after a certain period of time during these 12 hours, then the blood starts getting too thick to move and will stay in one place. So if we find a body laying in a particular position and the lividity, the, the, the blood within the body that we can see in the skin, if it doesn't seem to match, we know the body was moved. And that's why we've got this one uh, diagram up here. I'm not sure how clear this is. But you can see the lividity is fixed right around the lower back and spine. And yet the person is laying on their side. That tells us that the person was originally laying on their back when they expired. And then sometime later, after lividity was fixed, the body was moved. Also, if you are laying on something as the blood begins to settle, the pressures of those objects you are laying on or touching can actually move the blood in different patterns. This is an actual lividity pattern found on someone. If you think about it, what could cause those little checkerboard type things? Well, this person expired while sitting in a lawn chair or laying in a lawn chair. And you can see that the straps of the lawn chair actually push the blood into the spaces where the straps were not. So we can tell that this person died and was laying in that type of chair for a long enough period of time for lividity to become fixed. And finally, we have Elgar mortis. Quite simply, that's body temperature. Your body has a particular temperature, and everybody says a little bit different, but we all have a particular body temperature while we're alive. Well, of course, when we expire, we start cooling off. Generally, the body cools off between two and two and a half degrees per hour for the first few hours, and then the cooling actually slows. Now, it would be great if everybody's body cooled the same all the time, because then it would be very simple. We measure the body temperature, we calculate back how many hours has this body been cooling, and then we've got a very accurate time of death. 
Unfortunately, people have different body temperatures to start with. Not only that, but let's think about your body temperature. Are there some times when your body is hotter or colder? Let's say, for example, you are being chased by someone and you're running for a long period of time. Your body temperature is going to go up. Did you have a fever? Your body temperature is going to go down. Were you in a colder environment before you died? Your body temperature is going to be lower than it's supposed to be. So people can have different normal temperatures. A disease could cause, if you have a fever, that's going to raise your body temperature. Exercise or stress, simply simple stress, could actually cause your body temperature to go up before you die. Also, where were you when you died? If you were in a room with nice, normal 70-something degrees room temperature, well, then we can start working with this 2 to 2.5 two degrees. But were you outside? Were you inside? How much clothing were you wearing? What were you laying on? Were you laying against something cold? Were you laying against something warm? Was, that, uh, was there something to artificially warm your body or cool your body after death? And you can see that not only are these conditions important to determine um, how long ago did you die, but also they could change, especially something like the outside or the inside conditions. If you uh, perish in a house and uh, an hour later the heat comes out in your house in sort of automatic setting, that could screw up this cooling of the body. Uh, if you're outside during the day where it's warm, but then it's much cooler at night, uh, you know, 12 hours later it's much cooler, your body's cooling much more rapidly. So there's a lot of issues with using body temperature to, um, to determine the time of death, although... There have been lots and lots of studies so that there's complicated methods of determining things like change in the outside temperature or the amount of clothing to help us determine the actual time of death. Final thing we're going to go through is performing an autopsy. Now, we're not going to do one right now, but we'll do some parts of autopsies later on, hopefully when we're all back together. When you're doing an autopsy, what questions are you trying to answer? Well, in some cases, one of the first questions is, who is the deceased person? If you're unsure, performing an autopsy can help you determine who that person is. Uh, if you watch enough of these crime shows, uh, some of the unusual things, like if they find um, uh, surgical pins in you from broken bones or whatnot, sometimes the surgical pins will have serial numbers on them, and we can trace the serial numbers back to a particular person. There have even been, um, at least some of the TV shows I've seen, where breast implants were actually removed during an autopsy, and the serial numbers on those helped trace who the person in particular was. Autopsies, obviously, how did they die? The cause of death. Also, the autopsy can help determine where they died, uh, based on some of the factors we talked about. Were they outside? Were they inside? Um, what do they have? Did they breathe in something? Um, were they drowned in fresh water or salt water? We'll be talking a bit about that as well. And the autopsy can help determine when they died, the, the time of death, either through things such as the three categories we've talked about before or looking at the categories we talked about earlier, which is the biochemical markers of the vitreous humor to determine how long they've been dead. So, what are the steps in an autopsy? The first thing you're going to do when you're about to begin an autopsy actually starts when the body is found. The first thing you want to do is secure the body. And what do I mean by that? Protect it from contamination. Protect it from loss of evidence. Uh, if you notice that there's a, a body in a particular place, and is it going to start to rain? Well, the first thing you want to do is make sure that body is not going to get contaminated. As you're moving the body, you want to make sure that um, uh, any type of evidence that may be on the body doesn't fall off, uh, whether it's in some cases fingerprints or um, uh, any other types of fluids. Uh, you also don't want to cause any, any other types of injuries or marks on the body to add evidence that actually wasn't from the crime. So, once you've got your body secured, the next thing is the external exam. Before there's any cutting going on, the body is examined very carefully all the way around. We're looking for scars, we're looking for injuries, we're looking for marks. Could be a needle mark, 
Um, uh, it could be uh, evidence of bruising, old bruising, new bruising. We'll talk about those. And then once that's been done and documented, then we begin what's called the Y incision. And the Y incision, you can see, goes right down to the center of the chest and then straight down to the bottom of the torso. After that, you're also going to perform, uh, um, you're going to excise the skin from the skull. They actually have a procedure where they cut the skin, and if this is getting gross, I apologize, this is what actually happens, where they peel the skin off the top of the head, and they can remove the skull, uh, the, the part of the skull, not the entire one, but they'll cut open part of the skull in order to be able to look at the brain After that, the Y incision, they can remove the organs. And each organ is actually examined, and we look for disease, we look for trauma, are there, is there bruising, is there, are there cuts, is there a bullet in a particular organ? And after we've weighed and examined all the organs, then we can start analyzing the tissues and analyzing the fluids, looking at the blood, looking at the urine, looking at the vitreous humor. Uh, analyzing the liver cells to see what sort of shape they're in. This takes the most amount of time because there's so many different tests you can run on so many different parts of the body. It could take the longest amount of time. And once that part is done, once they've analyzed all the different tissues and fluids and they no longer need any samples, then they will begin to put the organs back into the body. They will begin to put the, the skin from the Y incision and from the uh, skull incision they'll begin to put everything back and get prepared to uh, send that to a funeral home. So what are some of the organs that are examined during a typical autopsy? Well, obviously, we take a look at the heart, the lungs, the liver, the spleen. That's the part where the red blood cells go to die. Stomach and intestines. We can look at stomach content and, the, and the, uh, uh, how well the stomach is in, intact. The kidneys and the bladder the pancreas. We look at the entire neck region, uh, strangulation cases. This is a good place to find evidence for that. We look through the sex organs. And of course, we look through the brain. Now, this is just a brief overview of some of the categories we've looked at. When you go back to your actual textbook, for example, when it's talking about the major organ systems, your textbook talks about the heart what they look for in the heart, what do they look for in the lungs, what do they look for in the liver, the gallbladder. Also, it goes through a lot more information as to how the autopsy is started, the external examination. It goes a lot more in depth into the different steps there. The textbook also talks about more information as to why you're doing an autopsy, besides just who are you, um, when did you become ill is in there, uh, when did you get hurt, and where did you die? So there's a lot more stuff in here than just the brief overview I've covered. But I was trying to explain the, the different parts. Right here, there's a whole list of when autopsies have to be performed. Now here's one. Any death from a standard lower risk medical procedure. For example, we've talked about high risk medical procedures can be labeled as natural death. But if you're having your appendix out, and you're a nice, healthy person, you're having your appendix out, and you ended up dying on the operating table, that's something that's going to require an autopsy to find out what actually caused it. So, again, lots more information in here, a lot, lot better descriptions on things like algor mortis and liver mortis and everything else here. So I'm giving you a brief overview. Please, go through, read the text. Lots of good information there. And if you guys have any other questions on this, let me know.